Obviously, things look a little different this morning, and um, I told you last week we're in the middle of a, well, we're at the end now of a four-week series on our mission as a church, and the last three weeks we talked about reaching the lost, reaching our community for the Lord. We talked about worshiping God, um, and last week was discipling believers, teaching, training people, and this week is titled Showing Compassion, and what what that means, and I'm, I've, had, I've asked four people to join me this morning. We're going to hear from everybody, um, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, but that's a pretty broad category, showing compassion. And there's a lot of ways that that shows up in the church world, and I'll just give you a few. Uh, showing compassion could be um, helping people that are in need of basic needs, food, shelter, clothing. It could mean visiting people in the hospital who are sick or at their homes, It could be visiting people in prison. It could be helping those that don't have a family that are in need, maybe, um, you know, due to circumstances in their life, or maybe they're just out in California and there's nobody else around. There's a lot of different ways we can show compassion, and I wanted to highlight a few of those because this has been something that has been part of our identity in our church for a long time. Uh, We've had a lot of large ministries happen um, on the campus, We've had things happen off campus. We've had outreach centers open throughout this community. We've had individuals going and meeting the needs and ministering to people, and we still do. And I know that many of you are involved in this as well, and that's a great thing because it is a part of our identity. I asked these three gentlemen here to share because they have a specific uh, story and testimony, not just of their own life, but also in areas that they've served in as well. And um, some of them you may not have heard before. So um, I know everybody is looking to get on the stage and speak in front of people. So, you know, after they're done, maybe next week, you know, I'll have you guys come up. But um, so please just uh, help, you know, help give them your attention and and hear them out. And uh, this is very important. I wanted to start us off before I I, uh, pass us over here uh, with a scripture here in in Luke 4.18. And... Jesus quotes this, which is found in Isaiah 61, and he talks about why he was here. And this is what he said uh, to those that were listening. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And so, Was it just for Jesus to remember the poor and the oppressed? Uh, The Bible makes it really clear that it's not just for Jesus. In fact, he was setting an example of things to come. And he shows us what the gospel is all about and how it interacts with everybody on the planet, regardless of circumstances, past histories, good and bad decisions, whatever, right? And I have some scriptures I'll share with you at the end, but um, I wanted to introduce our, our panel. Um, right here we have Trent Glasgow, and uh, Trent's been at this church a long time, um, more than 10 years, right? 17 years this coming March. Um, so we know who Trent is. Uh, we have Larry Conine here, who's been at the church longer than that. We'll just we'll leave it at that. Um, and Al Taylor is relatively new here. And so uh, we're happy to have him on board. Um, I'd like, Al, if you don't mind grabbing that microphone, and we're going to end up passing that one over when it's time, but I'm going to start with you. And I wanted you to go ahead and just greet the people, let them know a little bit about who you are and about, uh, you know, your introduction and as much as you want to share. Okay. Uh, As he said, my name's Al Taylor, also known, known as Albert. Taylor, I, uh, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm 73 years old, just turned 73. I, uh, do I look like an old grandfather type? Do I, I look like a peaceful old guy? Well, I wasn't always that way. If you look in the scriptures in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's 5, uh, 17, he talks about being a a new creature. 
Those that are in Christ are a new creature. Old things are gone. They're gone. They don't exist. They do not exist unless one brings them back to mind. So I, uh, when I learned that, I was in prison serving a life sentence for uh, capital uh, homicide. I did 42 years in there. And you think, my goodness, why so long? Because I needed it, you know. There, there is no other explanation. I did not know how to control myself as a young man. I was a behavior problem for the first 11 years I was in. And on the 11th year, the Lord came into my life, turned me around completely. I spent the next uh, 10 years convincing the guards that it was real. Because I, when I said I was a behavior problem, I uh, used to be known as knockout knock out Al. I had no problem knocking a cop out or an inmate. I was not a nice person. But like I said, when the Lord came into my life, a new creature was there. Somebody I did not know, and he had to, the Lord had to teach me who I was. And you know, I'm a man. I'm not an animal. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a thief. I'm not a murderer. I am a son of God. And I had to learn what that statement meant. And it has not been an easy road. And as many of you know, we are called to a hard road. The Christian life is not something you want if you want fun and games. Because that's not what this is about. This is about making men and women into the very image of God Almighty. Christ in us, being conformed in us. We are being made like Christ. You know, think about that. You want a miracle? Read uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were in your dead in your trespasses. And sins. He made us alive. We could not even respond to him if he had not made us now, let me ask you something. Before that 11th year, did you ever think that God could find you in prison? Did you expect that to happen? When I was a child, I used to go to a Baptist church. And the pastor had a very pretty girl daughter, same age as me. And there was another uh, little guy, same age as me and her. And he talked me into going and getting saved, going down front. So I would impress her, the pastor's daughter, and I did that. And uh, I had no knowledge of Christ. I had no uh, life uh, infused in me. But I know this, from looking back over my life, the Lord has been with me every step of the way since I was a child. Before I knew him, he kept me alive. And you know... If that's not a miracle, I don't know what it is, you know. That's right. I do not know what it is. So tell us, what are some things that changed when you, when you started serving God? What changed in you? That changed? Yep. Everything changed. I walked from darkness into light. I learned how to be honest, even when it was not uh, to my uh, benefit to be honest. The Lord taught me to look at other people and put myself in their shoes. That's what love is. You, you identify totally with what another person is feeling. And uh, he has taught me so much. At one time, I had no problem stealing anything. I'd steal from my mother, my sister, my brother. There was no boundary. Now I'll give my last penny to anybody that needs it. I will go without food to give to others. Because of me? No. Because of him. He has given me a new life. A new way of looking at life I never had before. You know? Do you take mud and put it on the dinner table? No. You do not. First, you put seed in that dirt. And you let the plant grow, and then you take the product, and you put it on the table, and you put it in your body, and the Lord uses it. 
ministers, same way with us. We, at one time, I see myself as so filthy. I've had people correct, oh, don't talk about yourself like that. Well, what do you call a thief, lying, murderer, scumbag? What do you call them? That's what I was without Christ. I was nothing. And he's taught me to love. He's taught me to care about others. He's taught me, I don't know. He's just taught me to be a man, you know. These are qualities that must be in a man, you know. And I never had any of them. And I, I praise him. I thank him. I just give all glory and honor to him. Because he has done an awesome thing in my life. You know, I've got brothers still in prison. Brothers in Christ. Closer than brothers that came out of my own mother's womb. These guys were, you know, they were there thick and thin. We walked through a darkness that you have no idea sometimes what it was like. When we went to Chow, on one side of the Chow Hall, black and on the other side was white and if you were white you did not go over there I don't care if all your Christian brothers were over there you did not go over there Lord I had been a Christian um, I guess this was in 1984 I'd been a Christian for three four years and he put me in a real bad institution Tracy and Tracy was called the Gladiator School. And they used to joke when you go in there, they give, issue you a bunch of uh, magazines and a, a garbage can lid. Magazines you put around your uh, waist and your back, and you had the garbage can. That was all a joke, but it, it was literally like that. When I got there, the Lord told me, I am your protection. I am your strength. I did not get out and play convict games. I did not hang out with it. I went right to the chapel where my brothers were. I went right to the chapel where everybody was getting made fun of. I went right to the chapel where nobody was thought of as anything uh, important at all on the yard. I'd been there two years, maybe three. And the Lord just put it where it irritated me to go through the chow hall line, a real long line, talking to my black brother or my Mexican brother, and we get down to the end of the line, and he has to go that way, and I have to go that way. It doesn't matter if our conversation's finished or not. And the Lord showed me, no. If I say that I am a son of God and that the Lord God Almighty protects me, why am I fearful of all these things? So one day I went and I told the brother what I was going to do and I shared with several of the brothers so they were not under, unaware and I went and sat down on the black side. The only white man over there. Was I afraid? No. I don't know why I was afraid. Well, I do know why. It was the Spirit of God. But I didn't have the fear that if it had been me by myself, I would have been terrified. I would have wanted the night or something to protect myself. But in Christ, he's my protector. So I went and sat down with him, and I'm talking to brothers. And this uh, racist gang leader, or white gang leader, calls me up to the line. He says, hey, you, come here. And I go over, and he says, hey, a-ho, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm sitting down having lunch. He says, are you a in? And he used that word. I said, I don't know what you're speaking of. I said, I'm the son of God. I, I am in Christ Jesus. You know, and I don't, I, you know, this doesn't uh, pertain to me no more. You do what you have to do. I'm doing what I have to do. And I went and sat back down. That evening, I uh, come down in the day room, and this guy had his little buddies around him. 
And he says, hey, you, come here. I told him, no, I don't feel like coming over here. You come over here. And he came over there, you know, surprisingly. And he says, look, I know you're a Christian. I don't want a bunch of uh, uh, BS around on the tier about you going in sitting on the uh, black side. He said, I don't want to hear that. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm very, very sorry. But the Lord has put it upon my heart to break down that, to sit where he wants me to sit. Not where I want to sit or where you want me to sit, but where he wants me to sit. And I went there every day for the last, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years I was there. I was there a total of 18 years. And I sat wherever the Lord, and you know what's funny? They had a meeting. All of the uh, gang leaders had a meeting. And they said, look, we have decided, we have decided to give you guys two back rows of table. There was about 12 or 14 rows of table. And I said, you decided that. Very good. That, that, we appreciate that. We really do. And we did. And I'm not making fun of them. They did what they uh, did in darkness. You know, and that darkness, it doesn't matter what games they play. You know, all of the racist stuff, all of that does not matter. Because when you come into Christ, it all breaks down. You know, you're a new creature. You know? yeah, yes, that's right. <clears throat> and Al, I'm going to um, just ask you real quick, and then I want to hear from Larry. Um, just tell us what was, what, what? brought you to new life i know you were at the moment coming out of covid um you you were not in a church fellowship at that moment and uh who knocked on your door or how did that happen uh when you arrived here well briefly when i uh, got out of prison i had to go to los angeles to a, a halfway house that was uh ran by a, a catholic uh sister the only uh, uh church or fellowship I had uh, open to me was uh, the Maranatha Community Church, which was an all-black community church, and uh, um, I think it's now in the east of uh, L.A., but it was in South Central. And South Central is one of the toughest parts of the uh, town. So when I left there, I come up here, I, I don't have any I've gone to all kinds of church line, I won't name them. And some of them uh, received me warmly, somewhat. Others, not so much. And I understand that. You, when you have an individual you want to know him before you trust him. That's understandable. So, but all these churches, they showed no, very little interest in uh, you know, having another brother there that was my back. For 10, 11 years, I didn't have any fellowship except on uh, TV. I watched uh, Charles Stanley. I uh, watched, uh, you know, whatever I watched, you know. But it, that was my fellowship. That and phone calls to brothers and, uh, that were in, you know, we talked on the phone and whatnot. But that was the only fellowship. I was on the phone talking to two brothers, uh, and we had a three-way something I never remember. I mean, I could uh, just blow your mind about how I have learned about technology. <laughs> but I, we were on this three-way, and I said, brothers, uh, you know, I, I'm fixing to get off the phone, but will you guys do me a favor? I said, I know I've asked and asked and asked. Uh, will you pray for me that I get a home church? You know, I don't care where it is. I said, I don't have transportation. I have no way to get there, you know, and it's got to be something specific when you pray. And they, we prayed, got off the phone, you're knocking, your sister Mary and another sister, and they come in, come to the door, and I ask them, are you Jehovah's Witness? Because <laughs> I just don't want to deal with that right now. And you get they that a lot. No, we're not Jehovah's Witness. 
And uh, they come in and we shared. And uh, they uh, realized we don't have transportation. Sister Mary volunteered. Uh, every other weekend she comes and uh, brings me and my wife, uh, Chris, to church. And uh, the other uh, weekend, uh, Brother Brian, uh, whose son Jeremy, He comes and uh, takes us the other weekend. So the Lord's provided us. And, you know, I've never, never been in churches where they speak in tongues. And I thought, is that going to be an issue, Lord? He said, it's not an issue with me. Why would it be an issue with you? Yeah. So I, I don't, I, I only want this. I want to be used by the Lord in whatever capacity he wants me to be used. That's what I want. In this church, I, I see some awesome, loving individuals. I see some that struggle. And believe me, I know struggle. And, you know, the only thing I, I really want to say to the church is, hang in there. It's yeah. not your battle. It's his. He's given you salvation. He's keeping you saved every day. It does, you know, when the, the Lord was tempted by the, the devil, you know what he said? If you are the Son of God, and he does that to us, if you are saved, if you are worthy, if you are this, if, you know what I'm saying? Don't listen to all that. Don't listen to your feelings. I'm a gutless nobody. You're not. You're a son of God, and the Lord's going to show you you got backbone you never knew you had. You know? And standing up and saying Christ is Lord to a whole room full of atheists, you've got to have backbone. You, know? you do not do that without backbone. And Paul... He says, I don't come to you with a bunch of uh, flowery words. I come to you with one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the Lord does the rest. He makes us alive by hearing that, you know, and he does the rest. So if you're struggling, struggle on. The Lord's with you. You know, when the brothers were in the boat and the boat was doing all this and the Lord was sleeping, they come and said, don't you care we're perishing? <laughs> Here's the Lord God Almighty that made everything asleep in the boat. And they said, don't you care we perish? He says, oh, ye of little faith. You know, and he told the winds, be still. And the, the waves. And everything was calm and they were at where they were going. You see what I'm saying? This is our life. We are in storms constantly and we're going to be in storms constantly. You know? And I thank God for that. Amen. 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 Brother, if you don't mind passing that over to Larry. Right. And um, this will tie in because, you know, God can make somebody of us wherever we are. You know, so maybe if you would have met Al 30, 40, well, 50 years ago, you might have thought, oh, no, there's no hope. It, it can't happen. But uh, you just never know. And, you know, when we, when we do outreach out of ourselves, whether it's with the church or by ourselves on a personal evangelism or something, we never know what God is trying to do. I mean, we would have never guessed that you, you would be here today a year ago. But... There's a lot of us in this room right now that have a similar story about how God took us and it wasn't very likely that he would do it in our minds, and yet here we sit today. Um, Larry Conine has an interesting ministry that he's involved in, which has a lot to do with people in prison. Um, tell us what you've been up to and just give us a little, a little story there. Uh, the year was 2003. Um, I was uh, delivering rice from this, the community area here down to Southern California. And uh, it was to Neutro Dog Food Plant. Uh, feed your dogs Neutro, yeah. Um, so 
to deliver the product, you have to uh, get in line with other trucks, and it takes approximately one hour for uh, the trucks to be emptied. So while I was waiting in line, uh, this gentleman parked behind me, and he was walking towards the office, which is in front of me, and he yelled at me, what are you doing in there, reading your Bible? And I went, uh, yeah. And the reason he asked was because the, the logo of my transportation was called Last Harvest Transport, and I had three crosses in, superimposed behind the words. And he said, eh, I figured as much. So he walks into the office, and he comes back out. So he says, uh, as he's walking back to his truck, he says, are you done? I said, no. So I stepped out. I got right in his face, and I said, do you know Jesus? And he can't go anywhere because there's five trucks in line. So for three hours, I witnessed to this young man over and over. We went over everything. And he said, I've heard enough. I've heard enough, right? So I said, well, so we moved the trucks periodically. And, and that pretty much summed it. He went back to his truck. And that was pretty much it. The next weekend, I take a load of rice back down to neutral again. And guess who I see? And this went on six times. So... We exchanged phone numbers because we kind of liked each other. We, we hit it off. And we used to talk every day on the phone when I was up here and he was down there because he was local down there. He, uh, one day when I called him, he blew me off on the phone and said, hey, uh, I ain't got time to talk. I got to go. So I knew something was wrong. And what he had done was he had scored some dope, met a young lady. That's enough. Um, that was the last time I saw him. He turned his phone off, wasn't able to speak to him no more. Uh, five months later, I get a phone call. This is his dad. And he says, I'm looking for the right Larry. And I go, excuse me? He says, yeah, uh, the right Larry was witnessing to my son about Jesus. And I said, you found him. So he says, well... My son, Anthony, went back to prison to finish his parole because he knew he was going to test dirty. And uh, he's written you five letters. And he wants to know where you live so he can send them. So about five days later, in the mail, I received 20 letters. Because what had happened, he was in the, the SHU, which is security housing unit. And uh, he was debriefing because he was a gay member. And he wanted to be clean so he could leave the prison and just have a tail instead of, you know, having to deal with the law a lot. Um, out of those letters, those 20 letters I went through, most of them, and there's only about five of them that really required me to write back to them and show them some love and compassion and understanding and different things. And basically, that's how it started. Um, there was no questioning in my mind, because at the time, you know, my wife was alive then, and we used to do uh, things here, uh, Hope for the Heart and different ministries. And my wife ended up being the secretary of the, of the church here for a long time, three years. And uh, I was doing that simultaneously. So uh, for, that was 2003, I really started into it in the winter of 2004 or of 2003 up into the winter of four. And I've uh, been doing it ever since. And I have uh, eight boxes of letters that uh, just prove that I did it anyway. <laughs> uh, but I can go back to some of them. I didn't really advertise them very well because I had to struggle to find one or two once in a while to uh, remember what somebody had said. But like... Pastor John was saying, is showing compassion and love. Um, I have was able to evangelize to quite a few at the beginning, probably the first, I don't know, say seven to eight years, somewhere around there. And I used to go to the prisons and visit. And that's when I would really get to evangelize because I could 
be visiting one inmate at the table and go over and they'd invite another guy over and he said, this guy needs Jesus and he would, uh, he would con you know, have a nice conference. And it worked pretty well for a while. Once in a while the guards said, hey, he's got to get back to his table, you know. But it worked really well for a long time. I had a, a lot of help people in, in this church helped me out quite a bit. Um, you know, the cost of mailing, in, in, you know, paper, computer, all this stuff. But it's worked out really well, and it's an amazing journey, I can tell you. Uh, Christ has done many magnificent things in my life. You know, when my, my wife had a heart attack and a stroke, I uh, parked my uh, trucking equipment and said, Lord, whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. So for two and a half years, he took care of us. And uh, at the end of it... Um, my wife went to heaven, and Pastor Al lost his secretary, and just different things happened. But the best part about it is, is the people. You realize that people are people. It doesn't matter whether they're a convict or whatever they are. It does not matter because they have the same emotional makeup and feelings and uh, the idiosyncrasies that we all have. Uh, they just wonder. Does anybody really care? And there are people that care. Uh, it's a, a wonderful journey. Uh, I'm still doing it. I still enjoy it. I'm down to only about 10 guys now. Used to be about 20. And uh, it's changed a lot. Now the prisons have, in California, they have tablets. Now they don't have to run out to the phone bank. They can call you from their cell. They give you a phone call. Hey, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. Um, the industry, and it is an industry. The CDC is an industry. The more people they have in it, the more money they make. Um, they they cut costs in many ways. Their food, things like that, and that's is a place where I came into a lot of times. I'd buy them a package, and it would have fifty percent food. 25% uh, things that they needed, you know, like um, deodorant and, you know, cosmetics, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then a little bit of, eh, buy some candy or whatever you want, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I've known quite a few that had nobody whatsoever, and those are the ones I really like to help the most. Uh, no, no family to uh, take care of them, call them, uh, be with them, so... That's pretty much what I do most of the time. I'm busy all the time now with the phone. I don't write as many letters as I used to because we have what they call an instant messaging. But it still has to go through a process of being checked out to make sure you're not doing anything secretive, you know, because that's the way they think. Uh, but I get the messages uh, and, you know, they say, hey, can you do this or can you do that? Uh, like in... One of the prisons in Corcoran, there's a, a gentleman there that's been locked up, I think, six years. But he's a, he's a pastor. He's a counselor. He's a, a, a Bible study teacher. <clears throat> he does everything. Uh, he does a really good job. And uh, to show you what it's like when a man of God's in prison and they're running a ministry in the yard, he... He was in Soledad, and he uh, had been there for about a year. Usually they transfer you every couple of years sometimes, depending on, on what your, your term limit is and stuff. But he was there, uh, had the yard ministry doing really well, and this guy came up to him and uh, accused him of using Jesus as a crutch and this and that and other things. He said, I can run this ministry better than you. So Bruce, that was his name, he stepped down. He said, you can have it. It's yours. Lo and behold, the next day he was transferred to McFarland. And he was down there for two years. And in Soledad, on the A yard where he was, they uh, uh, were doing the ministry. This guy, he only had it for a week before it shut down. Because if God ain't in it, it's not working. I don't care who you are. So when Bruce went to McFarland, he started another one. 
and he was there until they shut McFarland down, and now he's in Corcoran because when COVID hit, uh, the bus was just getting ready. He was still going up the highway, and he was real close to Corcoran, and they said, pull in because they didn't want nobody to go anywhere else. They weren't transporting nobody. So he's still at Corcoran. He's been there a few years now. But uh, he started another yard ministry there, and he's doing wonderful. And I spend a lot of time helping him do things. I make certificates uh, for the group. Um, I just made calendars for him, 24 count, you know, the, the year 24 calendars. We are, yeah, 24. And uh, uh, just, I do different things for him. Uh, it's just showing Jesus' love. That's what we got to do. And it's, uh, it's a good thing. And if any of you are interested in it, I have some information for you. But first, pray about it first. Ask God if this is what he would like you to do. Because with me, I didn't have to ask. He was there. So... Yeah, and we're hoping, uh, um, it's my hope as your pastor that sometimes just hearing about ministries that are happening, you know, when you come on a Sunday morning, we have <clears throat> kind of a set, you know, format that we do. We have a place for the, the word normally in this hour, and we have our worship time after that, and we have dozens of people in this congregation that are involved in ministry that you would never know about, and uh, you would never hear their testimony on a Sunday morning, very likely, and sometimes, some of you are more shy than others, uh, you're not interacting with everybody across this church throughout the week, and you could be here for a long time and not know that there are things going on that you could be a part of, and there are ministries and there are people that you could be connected to in this church and actually serve the Lord alongside one another. Um, so if, yeah, if anybody... I mean, if you've been at this church six months or a year, you may not know that Larry is writing and calling people in prison and that you can be a part of that. And so we wanted to, we've, I approached Larry um, a few months back <clears throat> and I said, you know, uh, there may be other people in our church that would want to be a part of this ministry in some way. Maybe it's not making the phone calls. Maybe it is writing letters. Maybe it's helping to make things for them that they need and resourcing even some people in prison who are the ministers to their prison. And that's why I also wanted Al to come up so that you could see, hey, there's living proof that God reaches people everywhere. And he not only reaches them, but then he uses them for his glory right where they are. And, uh, and that'll bring us over to Trent if you want to pass that over one. I want to hear from Trent here. Um, and I wanted you to know that sometimes when you're down and out, Maybe you're in prison. Maybe you're homeless. Maybe you just have a set of circumstances that you think you're the only one. And I think this happens to a lot of us, um, whether we're Christians or not. We can wake up one day and life gets in our way, and we think that we are dealing with a problem that is only us. Like it's just, oh, it's got to be, maybe we think God's mad at us. Maybe we just think the rest of the world's perfect or something, and we don't see hope out of it. And uh, Trent has been, has an interesting testimony. I don't know what he's going to share specifically there, but he's also been involved in a lot of ministries to people just like that, who were probably at the end of their rope and didn't have a foreseeable way out. And yet, God found them right where they are as well. Um, just share a little bit with us. What part? You can start with, uh, <laughs> just start a little bit about your testimony and then maybe talk about some of those ministries. All right. That you've been involved in? Um, well, I don't have uh, I, don't, I don't have the same I mean these guys have a prison ministry mine's a little different um, I probably was headed for prison I think God gave me an opportunity he gave me a choice you go down this road or you go down this road I, I think I heard his voice he's been with me just like Al had said for since I was young, uh, it was interesting. I when I was seven years old, I heard his voice. I was in my backyard, and I and I heard this voice say, "You're going to see the end of the world in your lifetime." And I thought, as a seven-year-old kid, I thought, "Well, that's weird. That's not me." <laughs> and so I just I thought back about that when I was a you know became a Christian, 
anyway, I'll just give you, I'll just touch a little bit on my, you know, my testimony, how I got, you know, the new life. Makes me nervous. Um, so we grew up in a, in a family, a middle class family. Uh, my dad, my father was a, a Yuba County Sheriff for about 18 years. He was an alcoholic. He was a sexaholic. He was severely abusive to me and my, my brother and my mom. And so uh, we grew up in that severely abused lifestyle all, all my young life uh, till they got divorced when we were 17 years old, when I was 17. Um, I ended up becoming my dad. And I had a secret life. I, um, I, I remember when I was 17, right before we got divorced, uh, it's kind of like pastor's testimony where uh, he was pulling the, the kids apart in you know, the front yard. And he said, hey, what about me? Well, I was in my front yard. Uh, uh, I woke up. I went, you know, got, got high, went in my room, went to sleep. And when, when I woke up to all this crashing and... Uh, I go out into my living room. All the, all the windows are broke out of the house. The TV's glass is everywhere. I go out in the front yard. The windows are broke out of the, uh, the cars. Uh, my mom and dad, my, mom, my dad's beating my mom up in the front yard. So I go get a chain. And all the anger from my whole life, I was just going to kill him. And uh, then I got mace sprayed in my face. I thought it was the cops. My brother said it was him. But then I ran down the road. So it was kind of like that our whole life. Uh, there was pornography all over the house. There was my mom, we'd, we'd come home, she'd be black and blue, she'd have missing teeth, be under threat of, she never left him because he would keep her under threat that he'd kill our whole family. Uh, he said he'd just shoot everybody. So that's just kind of a little background. I know it's horrible on how I got formed. And so, you know, as I'm going through life, I got this secret life. And, and I, I'm picking up prostitutes. I'm like Mary Magdalene. She had a bunch of demons. I don't think I was demon possessed, but I mean, there was just constantly in the bars, shutting down the bars, picking up women every night, uh, doing all this stuff. I know it's, it's horrible and it's shameful. But that's how my life was. And then I got married, and the adultery started. And um, so God had me on a, a path that I didn't see until after I was a Christian. And it was such an evil walk that I had. Um, I went blind in my left eye when I was in 1999 when my youngest daughter was alive. I don't want to leave that out because I think God had that planned. Because when I, in 1999, that was the height of my sin. I mean, I was going to topless bars and doing all this stuff. I'd go to work and it was just a different scene. And one day, I just told my, this is craziest thing to do but the guilt was so bad I just told my wife hey this is where I am and then I ended up going to a program a 12-step program for uh, sexaholics anonymous and it never worked it just you know I was going to AA at one point because I was just drinking a fifth of brandy a day driving my kids around in blackout drunks. And then I ended up at New Life. Nobody ends up at New Life unless they are called to New Life. God, this is a different church. This is a evangelistic church. And unless you've got a plan, God's got a plan for you, you don't end up here. And some people might have gone out and said, hey, I don't want that plan. But I was so broken 
by the time I got here, I just was broken. I got here, I lost everything. I lost my business, uh, went bankrupt. I had my two trucks. I even lost both my trucks because uh, I was driving around with no license. I think God said, well, we'll just take you a little further. Boom. And so when I got saved, I was sitting over there where Ron is. And I remember um, somebody got up at the pulpit and they, they said, there's somebody in this house that's doing everything they can to accept Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And immediately the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart and said, that's you. And there was this. And they gave an altar call. And I didn't want to come up because of the pride that I had. I was fighting it. But I said, okay, okay, Lord. I came up and I said, I will serve you the rest of my life. Because all my sin at that point was all this yuck was just in front of my face. And I think it was Leon Ford at the time was over there and he belted out this prophecy. And every time he would prophesy, it was like he was shooting an arrow across the room and it hit my heart and I started crying. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried because of the, all the sin that I had. You know, I mean, I wasn't, God knew my life, and he knew what I'd go through, but he also knew he'd give me an opportunity to walk and, and be saved and have Jesus in my heart. And he knew what the rest of my life would look like, and I am I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. You know, it hasn't been perfect. I've struggled, like Al says. I've struggled. You know, I mean, the enemy always is coming to me saying, you ain't saved, you ain't saved. And so I got a Philippians 1, 6. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I hold on to that. And, you know, when I came into New Life Assembly, Steve's, you got, I don't know, a lot of you know Steve Smotherman and Nita Smotherman. Pastor Al calls Steve one of his church fathers. And this man was filled with love. And I was... <laughs> I was blessed that I could, when I got here, I had nothing, and then I lost my, my place to live. I had my two kids, Mariah and Tierra, and I didn't have anywhere to go because I was so depressed that I couldn't keep working in front of me. So I had no money, and Steve and Nita brought us into their home, and they took care of us for eight months, and they loved us. And then Bill and Sue did the same thing. The church took care of me for a whole year. And I'm telling you, I was discipled under Steve until he died three and a half years later. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me in my whole life. I, in his house, I learned love. For the first time, I saw a family who operated in love. And this guy had a ministry, and I think he gave me the mantle of his ministry. When I, when I, I got mad at him, and you know, I left, but anyway, I, we patched that up. <laughs> but there was 14 people living in Steve's house including me and my three daughters, when I left. And Steve, he learned to love people and everyone, whoever it was. It didn't matter who they were. And if he could have, he would have kept everybody. He, feel, he felt like if, if he could keep them in their house as long as he could, that they would walk in salvation. They would, they would make it. 
And that was his ministry. And I heard this. I don't know if it's true, but he said there's somewhere like 120 of his family members that got saved from his ministry. I don't know. But Steve's ministry, he, he, he said it was like, he had a friend, uh, Dave Hermiston. He called him a high flyer. He's an evangelist. He'd fly in and minister to somebody and fly out. And he, called, he said his ministry was in the trenches where people, you know, the, you know, down in the yuck. And so that rubbed off on me. And that's um, kind of where I started. Um, I started with a lot of some of the old prostitutes that I had seen. And it started in Pastor Al's office. We, were, we used to go into the office and pray in tongues at 9 o'clock in the morning. And one morning, I was in there praying in tongues. And this, the Holy Spirit just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was kind of embarrassed. It was Rodney and Pastor Al and Gary. And, and I was just crying and crying and crying. And, and he gave me a vision. Uh, he showed me in this vision, he showed me a little girl and a little boy. One was a drug addict and one was a prostitute. And he showed me the little girl lived down on Garden Avenue in a house with a white picket fence. And uh, some other stuff. And that, that uh, anyway, fast forward a couple days. And I'm down on, I'm going home. I just dropped my daughter off at the New Life Christian School. And there was this uh, lady out in front of one of the stores down there. And the Lord said, minister to her. And I said, okay, Lord. So I said, well, what would you have me say? He said, just tell her how much Jesus loves her. So I went over there and started talking to her. And I said, what? Uh, I just said, hey, the Lord said to tell you how much Jesus loves you. And she just started crying. And she said, she said, I pray every day that, to Jesus that he would deliver me from this heroin addiction. And, and she said, after we're talking a little bit, she said, don't you remember me? I said, no. She said, I live down on Garden Highway, or Garden Avenue, in a house with a white picket fence. And you used to come to me for three years and <laughs> so I started talking to her. And then I asked her to come to New Life. She came. She was coming on and off for a little while. And then uh, she ended up back out on the street. And then she was getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And then gray looking. Looked like she was going to die. And I said, Lord, why would you even have me talk to her? If you're just going to kill her. And, and then all of a sudden she ended up at Pathways. And she got, she got clean. And she called me up. I went over and visited her over there. And then, then she ended up moving, when she got out of Pathways, down to uh, Woodland. She ended up going to J Jimmy Killian's church down there. And she got saved. And it... It didn't look, her life didn't quite look, it was real rough. It didn't look like a Christian, but she died, oh, six, eight months later in, in her sleep. But I believe she went to heaven. Then, so I started just ministering. My ministry was like this. I started ministering to everybody that was in my path, in my life, all my old friends, all the people that I sinned with, and because I was so broken, I just wanted to tell them what Jesus had done for me. Because I knew that a miracle, and they all knew a miracle happened to me too. My brother was, is, he's not here this morning. I tried to get him to come, but he's been coming around my house, which is a miracle in itself, a lot. And 
they all confess that something happened to me, that God uh, did something to me. And um, so then I got into the, I, what else? Tell us about just because we only got a few more minutes. I know okay. the kids are out of Sunday school, right. um, and I want you to know that if you really want to know more about Compassion Ministries, that you should talk to somebody up on this panel or someone in this church that you know has been a part of this because we could talk a long time about yeah. this. Um, but I I wanted to just give a quick little highlight. Tell us about just a little bit of ministry out of the mission and um, with some people who were in that uh, situation in life. Um, okay, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about mission in the King's Castle. So uh, I went down to, I was, well, John was going down to the, the mission. He was representing New Life at uh, the, the rescue mission. And so I, the Lord put it in my heart, just go down and help him do whatever he want, you know, needed. And so we went down there and um, we ministered to a lot of people. Um, and it was that... So just a different, different thing down there. Um, I uh, remember we were going down there helping, and then John asked me one day, "Hey, uh, with no no warning, he said, hey, can you take over for me and preach?'" Oh, <laughs> so you know, I go down there, no 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 preparation, and go down there and take over for him. And um, let me back up real quick. I just want to touch on something real quick. Steve Barney, who was in our church, also came from, he was the little boy in that vision. He was a little boy. I met him, and he stayed on and off with me for four years in my house. And he's down in uh, Teen Challenge now, serving Teen Challenge. He just got his general contractor's license. He was 14 years homeless. He lived behind the, uh, the cemetery down there for 14 years. And God did a work in his life also. He was the other part of that, that vision. So anyway, back to the, um, the mission. Uh, John asked if I you know, would pray about it and maybe take it over. And so I did. And then we were down there for uh, two years um, at the, at the Ubisoft Rescue Mission. And um, to tell you the truth, that was one of the best times in my whole life. I had so much, we had so much fun down there. We'd go down there every month and uh, Tracy came along and, and uh, Sandy Prather, uh, she served, uh, I mean, she had a mission in, or a ministry in it herself. Just, she just took over the food ministry and was, I'm telling you, she was such a blessing. And then Mike Kurzik was doing the worship and a bunch of us were going down there and we just had a good time and we met a lot of people we saw a lot of people get saved I mean there were testimonies uh, guys that I grew up with uh, and did crime with and all this stuff they they were living in the jungle back behind the juvenile hall uh, homeless for a lot of years and I watched their lives changed I watched God give them a car then give them a job then give them a wife and it's just, it is just fun watching God change all these people. God, he's the God of the impossible. And I'm telling you, he is busy at the impossible. And then after the mission, we, uh, God woke me up in the middle of the night and, and uh, said, go down to the, uh, the, the Rio and pastor down there and he told me to rent the building but anyway so that was a uh, we ended up renting the building down there and then remodeling it and and then uh, we ministered to hundreds of people through just little um, little outreaches uh, New life would all, you know, everybody would come down there. We'd have a barbecue and we'd have a good time. And, you know, there's a microphone and we'd have worship. And, and you know, a lot of you guys came down there and, and supported us there. And um, there was a bunch of people 
that got touched inside that. At one point at the end, we, we ministered there for about a, a year, almost two years. And uh, at one point we had like five, six people at a Bible study inside the King's Castle. A lot of the homeless people from the, uh, the river bottoms. There was one lady in there. Her name was Bratney. Uh, never forget her. She, um, <laughs> I think she got saved. She, she told me one day, she said, well, a lot of people would tell her, why are you going to go down there to that king's castle? Uh, yeah, that's just stupid. And uh, she said, well, it's the only place I feel peace. And she told me one day, she says, I, I, uh, she goes, I, I don't understand my, what my life is changing. She goes, I used to go in, and she called it boosting, boost Walmart every day. She says, I can't do it anymore. It doesn't feel right. And she said, it doesn't feel right when I do drugs anymore. I remember she was in, she went into a, a trailer over there in the river bottoms. There's about 15 people slamming dope in there. And she was in that trailer with them, and she started talking about Jesus. And saying, hey, Jesus wouldn't like this. If you saw it, and, and I'm telling you, she ruined their high. <laughs> They scattered like little cockroaches. She was the last one in the trailer. <laughs> so she was evangelizing in the river bottoms, and she didn't even know she was uh, an evangelist. <laughs> anyway, I think, you know, that's, that's my story. I think uh, it, it sums it up, like you said about Steve, that compassion ministry is in the trenches. As much as these stories are great and we like to hear about transformation, um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you guys today. This is the one of the toughest areas of ministry that I'm ever involved in. I want you to know that. So, don't you dare take one of Larry's papers if you're not ready for it. <laughs> don't don't come over and say I want I want to do that. That sounds fun. There's nothing fun about it. There's nothing fun about it. Now, many of you guys are doing it and you get it but I want to leave you with this thought and when I say there's nothing fun about it there's nothing fun in the natural it's work it's hard it's dirty I mean physically it stinks a lot of times let's be real here has anybody remember Patrick you'll see his picture on my bookshelf if you ever gave him a ride you understand exactly what I'm talking about here and he was a wonderful person in our church for many years <clears throat> That's a story for another day, but I wanted to leave you with this um, thought that, uh, well, now it just left me. We were talking about it being in the trenches, and I was going somewhere with this, and now I'm gone. Um, just know this, that, oh, I know what it was. <laughs> and I know we went long today, but this is so important for our church and to me. Um, it's part of our identity. It's okay to just hear a little bit more about it, but uh, I don't want to keep you here forever, but I want you to know this. When you come on Sunday mornings, if you ever find yourself in a place where you just think, this is all we do here, or that it's just a production or something, or, oh, the pastor preaches, and then we have our worship, and then we go home, and that's all there is to New Life Assembly. I want you to know this and listen closely. You are not connected well enough to this body. You need to get close. You need to get closer. If that thought is in your mind when you come and go out of here, I don't care how long you've been in this church, you are missing out on so much that goes on among people in this church. The, the bulk, by far, you can talk to my wife if you have any questions, and she will tell you, this is not the bulk of ministry that happens at New Life Assembly. If you want to look at my phone, I will let you scroll through, and you will be, you'll be proved that this is. Look at pastor's phone records for the last 20 years, all times of day and night, things way beyond Sunday. Look at our Google timeline, and you say, what were you doing there? There's no roads there. <laughs> Look, this is, this is real ministry right here, and so is this, but this, this stuff is is needed. It's necessary in the world that we live in. We live in a world that people are broken, and they're broken because they do not have Jesus. 
And man, if you need more evidence than this, I don't know. Like we're looking at changed lives right here on this table right here and all throughout this church. And I want you to know if you don't know that, then you need to get closer. See, I'm not telling you that you did something wrong. I'm encouraging you, get more connected to people in this church and get more connected to Jesus because he's going to bring you into a place where you can make a difference. You can matter in your life, in your community. He's going to show you that your circumstances, he will use those for people. He will use those to help others. He will use your experiences and all of your diversity. And I just want to encourage you to do that. Get, get closer to what's going on. Ask how you can get more involved. And uh, now you know three people up here. And throughout the weeks and months ahead, you know, there'll be some opportunities to step in and to do some things. And I just want to encourage you to do it. Because really, lives are changed. And, uh, and our church history has proved that out. So let's stand up as we, as we pray. If you guys will, you can.